name above all names. I got to, uh, if you're new to our church and are new to us online, uh, first message last week was uh, an introduction uh, message, and this, in a sense, is almost like the first message again, uh, different than the introduction, of course. So uh, tonight, I've titled this message, Something from Nothing. Something from nothing, all right? Uh, Genesis 1 in a moment will be our, our text. You might as well begin in the beginning, right? So we'll go back to the beginning. But last week, as we brought the introduction message to the series, we learned that when you open the Bible, uh, right out of the Scriptures, we find some things concerning the name of God or the names of God. Uh, the Scriptures commands us to honor His name. The scriptures compel us to praise his name. We just praise God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, right? Uh, it also, the scriptures challenge us to trust in his name. And to do this, we certainly need to know his name, or in this case, his names. So uh, as I brought last week a couple of things, just to touch on it one more time to give us a beginning spot to move forward as you experience life as a follower of Jesus Christ, and hear that line carefully, as you experience life as a follower of Jesus Christ, when you learn what it means to abide with him, right out of John 15, to abide in Christ, you begin to experience him as you experience life, and you find out more about him, more about his character, more about his will for you, between reading the scriptures, experiencing life, knowing God's nature, just, just maturing, just going through life. Uh, and when you do that, you find out that God is. God is. If you were here last week, you remember that phrase, God is. We'll continually be hearing that in this series. God is everything we need him to be, when we need him to be it. And he has a name generally associated with those great needs in our lives. God is. He desires for us to know more about him, more about his attributes, not just by knowing his names, but by experiencing him as we experience life and go through life with him. We find out our God is all we need for all we will ever face. So you come to find out that that name is, again, to be praised, trusted, magnified, respected, honored, that his name is holy, he is good. That name is majestic. It is glorious. His name is near. I love that one, by the way. Amen. Not a God far away, but a God that is near. Because he is a God who desires, watch now, to be near to us. Yes. Near to us. The reason God gave us his name is in part to reveal his person. We need to be able to relate to his creation through that name, and that'll be our subject really tonight, and for him to release his promises into our life. When we know certain names about God, we know there are promises that are associated with that name to me and you, and we have those available uh, to us. So, in short, we can say it this way. God wants us to know him. That's good, isn't it? And to be known by him, and then we're to make him known. Just, just that simple. So today, we're going to turn our attention to the very first passage in Scripture, like I said in John 1. I had such a good time singing, I've just sang my mouth dry, so y'all forgive me a little bit tonight. So. And you're thinking right now, I wish I'd have brought some water in here, right? <laughs> it's really good if it helps you. All right. <laughs> so, uh, right out of the first passage, we're given the very first name God reveals to us, in John chapter 1. I mentioned last week, when you read through the Bible, oftentimes in our English translation, you just see the word God, G-O-D, right? And then other times, it will be, uh, it's translated, you get something Jehovah or Jehovah hyphenated and so forth. But if you're looking in the original languages and you look in the original Hebrew, those names are broken down and there have, they have some unique meanings that are there and that was the intent in which God gave us. And it's just wonderful to, uh, to find them out and to put study in and get those. So right out of the beginning here, God gives us a very special name about him. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word used there for God, as you see in the scripture, I inserted it there, is Elohim. 
Elohim just simply means eternal creator. Eternal creator. Here's where you're going to get the title back. God stepped out of nowhere, stood on nothing, and spoke into existence something out of nothing. And watch now, it takes faith to accept that. It takes faith to accept that. More about that in a minute too. Elohim is the most frequently used name of God in the Old Testament. The most frequent one. Used more than 2,500 times in the Old Testament. God, eternal creator, eternal creator, eternal creator. It's used 32 times in this first chapter. Eternal creator, eternal creator, eternal creator. Elohim is plural for El. It's associated with God. And it's the only name of God that is plural. So why is that important? Because when God said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, he meant God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Together, created all that, there we, that we see and all that there is were created by the three in one that we just sang and gave praise to. All of it was one God. So I, I don't understand that. I don't really either. But we're taking it by faith. Amen? And another day, we can go through all the things in the universe that are three in one. It, things like you and me. Body, mind, soul. You're three in one, and you're known by that. If you want it a little simpler, it's an egg. It's an egg white, an egg yellow, and a shell. <laughs> and all three are egg. Thank you very much. All right. So, he says, pluralistically, uh, we <laughs> have created God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Watch now. So, the Holy the Father is, is speaking, all three are Elohim. Notice in verse 2, so as God is saying this, and the Spirit of God is over the face of the deep. So, it's, here's God, and all the elements are created, and it's in total darkness and void and, and it's a chaotic mess, I guess you would say it that way, but the Spirit of God hovers over the deep. There he is in, in that spot. If you'll allow me to jump ahead, remember in the New Testament is when the name above all names is revealed, the name of Jesus, right? So we didn't know what to call his name in the Old Testament. God hadn't revealed it yet, but as the, as the apostles began to write, and they had to begin experiencing with Jesus and so forth. See, John 1 sounds just like Genesis 1.1. As John writes, in the beginning, the Word. The Word. Notice that the Word there is a capital W because it's a person. And the subject that John is writing about is Jesus. And that's the whole subject of, of John 1. It's about the eternal creator. In the beginning, the Word. In the beginning, Jesus already existed the Word, Jesus, was with God, and the Word, Jesus, was God. Amen. So we see all three now in creation. Let's see if I want a little more from, from, the, from the Word here. Colossians chapter 1. As Paul writes, as the Spirit of God has moved upon him, verses 15 through 17, Christ is the invisible image of the invisible God. Elohim is spirit. Jesus came and manifested himself. So you and I, or the people walking the, the earth that, uh, of that day, they could know God and see God and hear from God and know that God loved them. And so he says he, he existed before anything. Who? Jesus. He, Jesus, existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation for through him, God, Elohim, created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the, the things we can see and the things we can't see. Imagine a first century man not knowing a thing about atoms, but understanding there's just some things we can't see. Amen. Atoms, not Adam, atoms, A-T-O-M, atoms. All the molecules, all the things. He didn't understand it, but he said this all exists. The things we can't see exist because Jesus caused them to exist. And the spiritual realms here, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world, spiritual warfare is happening right now, everywhere. Everything was created through him, Jesus, and for him, Jesus. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. I grew up singing, he's got the whole world. 
So we see Elohim, plural, the eternal creator, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, creating everything we know in our world and in our universe, plus what we, and by the way, when I say universe by proper definition, I mean everything that there is. All right, in case we get off on something else. My definition of universe is all that there is. What we've now discovered in our galaxy, our galaxy, y'all know our galaxy? Everybody ought to know their address. Our address is the what? The Milky Way, right? We find out there's a lot of infinite, in, infinite number of things, um, like our galaxy is one of an infinite number of them. Unbelievable. And we struggle with that because we barely understand the planet that we live on. And it reminds me of a little allegory story. I think I heard it, and, and if you've read it somewhere, I'm not copying it. I just try to remember it, and I don't know who to give credit to. Um, you get my age, have cancer a couple times, you'll understand, all right? But it was an allegory about two ants, A-N-T, ants, a father and a son ant. They step up on the ant hill one day. Father ant gets his arm around his boy, says, son, look all the way out there to the back fence. Can you see it? Cross the yard all the way to the back fence. He said, that's all there is. And you're thinking, well, you dumb ants. That's just to the backyard, right? That's not all that is. That's just all you know. I, I just want to tell you, we no more understand the universe than those two ants. We no more understand our universe than those two ants do the backyard. Meaning, we think about our vast planet Earth. We'll put the earth up, let you look at it a second in case you don't know where you live. All right? Now think about this. It, the, the, the depths of its oceans, the heights of its mountains, Mount Everest. Think about that. The span of its landmass. And then we look up and we see that big orb up there. Man, I love to see that orb. I'm ready to see that orb. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Oh, man, I love to be on the beach, see that orb. We get beautiful sunsets here in northeast Ohio, too, don't we? Yeah, and we go to thinking about that sun. Don't stare at it. It'll hurt your eyes. Y'all know that, right? Just, just glance and look away. <laughs> that big sun. Then we think about that planet that you and I live on. We could put one million of those planets in that sun. One million planets. Planet Earth can fit inside the sun and then we we learn uh man that's just impossibly big but just wait there's a there's a greater scheme the sun would be like a pinprick to all the other stars that exist in the milky way that we have right here that we live in just the milky way like like a like a pinprick in comparison and hold up now then we re understand by looking in like the Hubble telescope, that there's a hundred billion galaxies like the one we live in. A hundred billion. I went to school in Arkansas. I can't even begin to tell you what that's like. A hundred billion. I don't know. A hundred billion? A hundred billion. Detectable by the telescopes we have and we can't see all there is. If each star was a grain of sand in our Milky Way, the one in the hundred billion that we know about and we live in, if it, each star represented a grain of sand, it would be like a 30-foot by 30-foot stretch of beach that would be three feet deep of sand. If a star was the size of a speck of sand and the entire earth doesn't have enough beaches to represent the stars in the overall universe that we just know about. That beach would extend for literally millions and millions of miles. And the hundred billion galaxies within range of our telescope are probably a minuscule fraction of the total. Two ants looking to the backyard. That's all there is. The vast majority of our galaxies, they say, are separating at a rate which can't even be calculated at the speed of light. 
let that sink in for a second. We don't even have a calculation for it, how fast it's moving from a central point out. As most of you know, we can talk for ages, literally ages, about the size of creation. And yet God just creates and lets you look at it and says, my card. <laughs> What's cool to me is God never tries to convince us that it's real. He just speaks, creates, and says, my card. <laughs> my wife, April, sitting right over here in Atlanta, when we lived there, uh, she's always dabbled in a little bit of real estate and stuff like that. She started building homes uh, down there for a while, a few years. And she would go take an empty lot where there was nothing, buy that, design the home, hire the contractors that worked for her. We had teams of people, and I say we, I mean she. And she put the house together and put a sign out front and people went in to see if they wanted the home. I never remember anybody going, April doesn't exist. No, she just don't exist. What do you mean she don't exist? No one would say that. How dumb is that? Now, you up here in Ohio, from what you know of her, may go, I don't know if she built that house or not. But if you went down to Atlanta and, and you know her and you were standing in her house, you would see her fingerprints all over it. Because there's little design things that she would do, and if somebody knew her, would go, oh, that's, a, that's April's house. She does that little thing here and a little thing there, and how could you miss it? That, that's, that's literally April's house, and that's what April would do is just, well, yeah, here's my card. It's my house. Where there was once nothing, there's now something. Yes, it was an empty lot, but there was a designer, and there was then the, the builder, and then here is the house. Behold, my card. There you go. Uh, God is saying in Genesis 1, 1, you're standing in my house. Here's my card. You're in my house. It's interesting to me that from the start, God wants to declare his name and make it clear he is the creator and sustainer of life. He's the builder and, and, and of all creation. All of creation, all of the universe is his house. When we get into a discussion with others about creation, I often hear people say this, well, where did God come from? The Bible clearly says he's always been, which is actually another name for God, and it's revealed to Moses in the book of Exodus when Moses saw the burning bush and God was commissioning him to go back to Pharaoh and to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And, and Moses was a little argumentative. And finally he says, well, who shall I tell them sent me? I am that I am sent you. You tell Moses, I am that I am sent you, which means, here's what I am that I am means, the self-existent one. I don't need Pharaoh. I don't need you, Moses. I don't need anybody. I'm before all things. I hold all things, and for me, all things consist. I'm the eternal self-existent one. I don't need oxygen. I made oxygen. God then says to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, not to Pharaoh, but to Israel. And this would be verse 15 of Exodus 3. Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Yahweh is rendered Jehovah in most of the Bible. It's the same name, same person, obviously. It's just another little element uh, uh, about the Lord. Sometimes in the English, you'll just see the Lord. The Lord is Jehovah. The Lord is Yahweh. And they're all God, and they're all Elohim. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So, Genesis, uh, well, I should say it this way, unlike the evolutionists who have to come up with where the first Adam come from, I don't have to make up my opinion. I simply believe by faith what God said in the beginning, God was already present and accountable. And he spoke the worlds into existence. So Genesis 1.1 is a simple declaration that Elohim has always existed. Remember, God is. He is. He is. He is. 
He's always been. He always will be. He's the self-existent one. If God is, what's the significance of that should be the question that comes to our heart and mind. If, I'm going to play the advocate here a little bit tonight and answer both ends of it because some people may be watching online or hearing our service and you go, I don't know about all that, and that's fine. It's fine. I just want to challenge you where you are with what you think and what you've been taught. And what happens is our young people come out of our churches and go over here to a school and they've got somebody with seven more years of college than they do and 20 more years of experience. And whether you're taking English or basket weaving, they go out of their way to say there is no God. And our young people go, well, maybe there's not. Now, the reason I know there's a God is because I have experienced him. You don't have to, it's not an argument for me to win and it's not a theological uh, debate or a, 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 a scientific debate, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit tonight. If you've experienced him, no one has to tell you, oh, God's real? Amen. Let me tell you I know he's real. Amen. God is, so what is the, it, what's the significance again? Well, it means everything. If God is, then bad can be made good, and sin can be atoned for, and chaos can be brought to order. If God is, there is hope for the hopeless and help for the helpless. If God is, then everything in life has meaning and purpose and life is precious and sacred and a gift from the eternal existent one. But if he isn't, well, we got a mess. And we'll revisit that in a moment, but I look out in my world right now and go, we got a mess because we have people going no God no need for no need for God the entire issue of God creation all the great questions of life you know all the great questions where did I come from why am I here where am I going what's the meaning of it all these questions are simply faith issues not Hear the word, not proof issues. Yes, amen. They're faith issues, not proof issues. Proof is not the issue. Amen. Proof has never been the issue. Never will it be the issue. If you want to understand that no matter how much proof you can find in the word of God and in science and in archaeology and recorded history or anthropology, proof will never be enough for a lost man. To put faith in God because there's already no there's already more proof for my side of this than the side they're holding on to Amen. here's an example someone said well if we could find part of the ark and we could prove this has happened well they people have found gopher wood all over that part of the world where the boat came to rest pitched with every just like God said it would be well that's not proof they'll argue that away Someone said, well, if we could find a living dinosaur somewhere, man, it would be the death of every evolutionist kind of a thing. So, uh, no, it wouldn't. Because proof has never been the issue. It's never been the issue. See, this, this all got debated up when Jesus told the story in Luke chapter 16, around about verse 27 right there. Jesus said there was a man named Lazarus who died and a rich man who died. Lazarus went to paradise, heaven, and the rich man died and lifted up his eyes in hell. And the rich man was tormented and begged, you know, Lazarus used to live under his table or sit at his table and just eat bread that fell off the table. And by the way, one didn't go to heaven because he was poor and the rich man go to hell because he's rich. It was because one had faith in the right thing and the other one didn't. And by the way, it wasn't a prosperity gospel, obviously, or the beggar wouldn't have went to heaven. Amen. So it just debunks a whole lot of stuff right there. But the rich man said, would you just send Lazarus to put his finger in some water and touch my tongue? I'm tormented in this flame. Then the conversation went on to this, and, he, and he's talking to, to, to Abraham. The parent, in, that, in that time, it's a whole other theological deal to talk about, but they could see one across a great gulf from paradise to hell. It's not that way now, but it, it was in this time before Christ had died for our sins and so forth. So, this, the, you know, 
the, the, Abraham, if you would send Lazarus from the, the place of death out of paradise to go warn my brothers not to come to this place. And Abraham said in that same passage right there, um, they won't listen to Moses and the prophets. They won't be persuaded even if someone raise, rises from the dead. Your first five books of the Bible is Mo, what Moses wrote. Genesis, Exodus, right? Numbers, y'all get it? Deuteronomy, Leviticus, all that. That's what Moses wrote. And all the prophets, that was all that the Bible was at that time. And he, so Abraham says, if they're not going to believe the Bible, they're not going to believe if someone raises from the dead. And you, you know later that Jesus raised another man named Lazarus from the dead. And what did people want to do? Let's kill him. He just died and Jesus rose him from the dead. Well, well we got to do something about him. They plotted to kill Jesus and Lazarus, kill him again. Kind of seemed pointless at that point, didn't it? And watch now, and Jesus himself was raised from the dead and was seen alive by the twelve. And according to Paul over in the book of Corinthians, to that church was seen by as many as 500 people at one time. Amen. Proof, ladies and gentlemen, is not the issue. Proof has never been the issue. This is what I can know to be true. God does not need me to defend him. He's his own defender. He is the great I am, the one who was and who is and who is to come. My assignment as his follower is to abide with him, follow him, speak for him when prompted to, stand up for him in a fallen world. And my job is that. His job is to touch hearts, open hearts, open minds, to make himself real to, to individuals who hear uh, the word and who will trust him, listen to the words by faith. Yes. By faith. God wants us to know he is Elohim, creator. He created something from nothing. We're here by design. We're here by divine providence, not by, hear these words again, not by chance. Amen. Not by chance. He desires a relationship with his creation. With his creation. And instead, man in many, if not most cases, has chosen to worship the creation and not the creator. If you're in a life group at our church, you're going to spend a lot of time where I'm not tonight, and that is in Romans chapter 1, in verses 19 through 32, because it's an age-old problem. It's not a problem in 2021. It was a problem in the first century. People still worship the creation in rebellion against the creator. So, proof is not the issue. Watch now. Science is not the issue either. The world would have you believe that science has all the answers. However, <laughs> it is a violation of all scientific laws to believe evolution, the Big Bang Theory, or by chance. A violation of science itself. Science itself gives us four principles of science. I don't think they'll let you out of the fifth grade unless you memorize this. Most of us have forgot it, but it's about a fifth grade deal that you're going to have to learn it in. Observation, hypothesis, testing, and repetition. So when it comes to the Big Bang, and it comes to by chance, and it comes to evolution, let's answer these things as they're given. Was there anybody there to observe it? No. Is there a hypothesis about it? Yes. We believe this big explosion happened out there somewhere. And these rocks formed, and you know, you know how it goes. Uh, it, was there anybody there to test that? No. Has it been repeated? And can it be repeated? No. By the laws of science, the whole thing is debunked by the science tests that set it up. That leads me to say, faith is not the issue. <laughs> Science is not the issue, but hear, hear what I'm saying. Faith is not the issue either. 
I don't have enough faith to believe evolution, Big Bang, or by chance. I'm telling you, I don't have enough faith for that. I do not have enough faith. Because it takes a whole lot more faith than what I'm operating in to believe Big Bang, evolution, and by chance. More than Elohim created. More than that. With that said, God would never promise, has never promised all the answers to every question. Some things are just going to remain a mystery. They just will be. The question is not whether that we can answer every question given by a scoffing world. The question is whether the Bible is trustworthy in all that it says. And what I have found thus far in my 54 years is a hearty amen that it's trustworthy in all that it says. And by the way, I'm talking about all that it says in history, in anthropology, in science. People were talking, you know, it wasn't that long ago we thought the world was flat. Some stupid idiots still think the world is flat. You know, you know that's a fact, right? Yet Isaiah talked about God sitting on the curvature of the earth thousands of years ago. It's trustworthy. Scoffers refuse to believe the miracle of creation, choosing to believe in theories like Big Bang, evolution theory, and by chance. Secular scientists have had a long-time problem, and they don't know how to get around it. Something they have to put faith in because observable science says this, something never comes from nothing. <laughs> something never comes from nothing. So their theory has no scientific explanation either. The Bible gives us at least a plausible beginning spot. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 echoes back to Genesis 1. By faith, there it is, by faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed by, at God's command that what we now see did not come from anything that can't be seen. Scientists say something can't come from nothing, yet what they hold on to is something did come from nothing. We have always attest that something came from nothing because God spoke it into existence. Psalm 19.1, the heavens proclaim the glory of God, the skies display his craftsmanship. Big Bang and evolution together are not science, they're theories Amen. that no one observed, no one tested, and no one could re replicate. And let me add this, they are religions. Yes, they are. Believed by faith. Yes. With their own... <laughs> Pastors in the college classroom and evangelists that come in and speak for them. They are their own religions. And it requires a great deal of faith and a whole lot of ignorance. The Bible tells us a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. How else can you explain how a person can deny God's existence, deny the creation account, live in the universe that we live in, and choose to believe Something like this, and, and, and you guys have had to go to schools that taught this. You will found some of this pretty familiar. But So there's an explosion somewhere out there somehow. We don't know what exploded, but something exploded. A living organism of some kind was found, made its way to this rock in the approximate location in which life could exist at this perfect distance from the sun, with the exact amount of water it would need to exist, and eventually it turned into some kind of complex single-cell organism, and after about two billion years, became a vertebrate some kind, became two sexes, swam in some pre-mortal soup, turning into a tadpole, turning into a frog, and into a fish, into an amphibian, and then into a primate, into a mammal, and then you know, its tail dropped off, it bumped its head, and it stood upright and went to Harvard. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, look at me in the face. It takes faith to believe what I just said. And that is what's preached at the religion of the university and the college. So, with all that, faith is required to believe no matter what you believe. Faith is required. 
I'm not asking you to choose faith over science. I'm telling you that any rational, intelligent person, if they look at the facts, must conclude that the universe declares there must be a creator. Amen. There must be. I'm telling you whether you believe in evolution or creation, faith is required. This podium is made of metal, and it's heavy. And metal comes from ore in the ground. We live the history of this, right? This was not in the ground like this. Someone dug up the ore, processed it, did a lot of things I don't even know how they do, designed it, shaped it into all this, painted it black and sparkly, put four screws here in the top to hold this part on because I, it, there's just no way that come out of the ground like that. Is that okay? It had a designer. And we could go back and go, where'd the ore come from? Why is it here? Let's give it a head start. How many millions of years would we need to wait for this to turn into... Put my Harley up. I don't think it'll be tonight. <laughs> you know what we need? A hundred billion years. Now let's go a hundred million. Come on now. Come on now. Look at that thing. A Harley. Any Harley people? Indian guys? Yeah, all right. Harley people. You know what that motorcycle is? It's systems within systems. It's a chassis system, braking system, fuel system. On and on that would go. Wiring system, systems within systems. A Harley Davidson is crafted. It's designed. And it's got that big bad motor with that exhaust system. And every man goes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of ladies too. Now look, what do you think me and you are? Systems within systems, thank you. A plus to that person. Well, we're a skeletal system. If not, I couldn't have picked it back up. A nervous system, and my back hurts because I did, right? <laughs> Respiratory system, muscular system. One of, the, one of the most uh, known atheists came to faith by being a doctor, studying a hand, dissecting and working on corpses, you know how they do, the cadavers with the hand, and he looked at that and kept looking at it, and he goes, there has to be a creator. Amen. A man became a medical missionary. I'm sorry, I don't remember his name. I know he lived in Nashville for a lot of years. Just looking, look at the eyeball. Study the eyeball. Study your ear, all the things that go with that, and tell me, well, how many millions and millions of years did it take? What arrogance and what rebellion to say there's no God. Yeah. Blindness, blindness to that. Yeah. All right. And by the way, we talked about a harlot. How many millions of years would it take for, for it to just turn into this? Show of hands, how many got something to think about with all that? Right? That's something to think about. So again, how long did it take for a single cell organism to turn into a man? Become two sexes, have children, all that. Um, 
God puts his fingerprints over his creation. You go to the ant, go to the bee, go to the bird, go to anything living, crawling organism on this earth and go, how could there not be a creator? How could there not be? Isaiah chapter 1. I'm, I'm putting this in the original King James Bible. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider, a sinful nation of people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children of, that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel into anger, and they've gone away backward. Welcome to America. Yeah. Even a stupid ox knows his owner, yeah. and a stubborn ass knows his owner. And people, God's, all people are God's people, you understand? Yes. Whether you've acknowledged that or not and become a, a follower of his, he owns us all. And we don't have sense enough that an ox or a donkey would have. Yes. The crown of creation is mankind, and we have gone away backwards in a fallen, arrogant, rebellious, brokenness, situation that we're in if we as a people choose to believe hear it again by faith if we choose to believe by faith that Elohim did not create us and the universe the results are the foundations are destroyed for all he planned for us because it's foundational that's why it's Genesis 1-1 and right at Genesis 1-1, he says, there are those who will accept this and those who will not, and it's as wide as darkness and light is the chasm that's there. So what happens when the foundations are destroyed? Psalm 11-3 answers that. When the foundations are, are being destroyed, excuse me, <clears throat> what can the righteous do? Well, what can we, if the foundation's gone, what's going to happen in the world that we live in? I'm going to say this and we're going to close, okay? Here's the results. By the way, if you want this, you know the, all the message notes are on, on the app. You can email them to yourself, okay? If Elohim did not create us, then we've evolved from the slime of nothingness and it's survival of the fittest. Just survival of the fittest. Dog eat dog, buddy. I got mine. You can't get it. I'll kill you if you take it. If Elohim, did, Elohim did, doesn't exist, we are accountable to no one, and we are left to just do what thou wilt, which is the very axiom right out of the Satanic Bible of what it means to be a Satanist. What it means to be a Satanist doesn't mean sacrificing babies and drinking blood. It just means do whatever you want to do. If there's no foundation and no accountability and Elohim is not our creator, then just what are we doing here? Let's just go and get and do and take and just do whatever you want to do. If we're not his creation, then we're just animals ourselves with a higher consciousness so we can be caught up and save whatever else is on the planet out there and equaling it to a, to a man or just struggling to survive. And, you know, we didn't, need not care about anybody except our own pack. And there's the two extremes that we go to. save the whale and kill the baby there is no room for God in evolution that's why it's its own religion that stands against God the Bible and all that God intended for all of us to, to know and experience with him because evolution leaves no room for God and lots of Christian people think it's a mix of each one no ladies and gentlemen you believe God created or you don't if there's no room for God in revelation, revelation, of evolution, rather, therefore there is no real difference in good and evil. What's your definition of good? And what's your definition of evil? Morality is just an illusion and truth is relative. There's no moral and ethical laws. Therefore, you'll live your own truth. 
That's the gospel according to Oprah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Whoever else is the latest dud on TV. Well, you just live your truth. Yeah. Truth is truth. How stupid is that? Two plus two is four. It can't be five. Five's not true. You live your truth. There's more. If no Elohim, there is no sin. There's no re need for redemption from a Savior. There would be no cross. There would be no resurrection. And it's all just a ruse and an elaborate hoax that was made up. That's where, you, that's where you're at. Friends, it's as if we're, we stand and pause and we look out at all that we can see that's around us and consider our universe and we consider the birds that fly and build nests and migrate and the hummingbirds and the bees and ants and everything around us and as if Satan comes along and says, nothing to see here. Oh, no, no. But we look at our bodies and look at, there, there must be a intelligent design. No, nothing to see here. Just keep busy. Survival of the fittest. Do your thing. Party, party, party. Go from one pleasure to the next. Nothing to see here. Move along. Watch now. The proof is not the issue. Science cannot be the issue. Faith is not the issue because it takes more faith to believe the other side. It leaves us with only one thing. The heart is the issue. The heart is the issue. You see, there is a God. And his name is Elohim. And as if he is taking your face in his hands and looking you around, look around you. You're in my house. This is my house. And I love you. By the way, every parent understands this. What one of us have not gotten our kids by the face? This is my house. Now look at me. I love you. What are you doing? Have you lost your mind? If you hadn't done that as a parent, you probably lack as a parent. Or you have the absolute best kids there's ever been. I've had to snatch all mine up and give them that talk. What, what in the world? Right? Look at me. I love you. I'm here for you. You get all my girls individually somewhere and ask them if these are not the words out of my mouth and their mother's mouth. Nobody will ever love you like I love you. Amen. Your mom and I will be the best friends you ever have. Do not forsake who you are in our relationship for anything. Amen. And sometimes you just got to get right there and do that. So God snatches us. I want to be your God. And I want you to be my people. I'm giving you my name. And by faith, I want you to believe with well, the letter I have given you. The psalmist answers this in a beautiful way. Psalm 95, 6 and 7. Come, let us worship and bow down. There's the response. Yeah, yeah. Let us kneel before the Lord, our what? Our maker. For he is our God. And we are his people. He watches over the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. I'm sorry I didn't give you all that verse, but I have it here. It had been a good one for you to see. But he is our maker, so don't harden your heart today because the heart is the issue. If your heart, it's your heart that he desires to make new. Watch now, I love to end where I began. He wants to make something out of nothing. Genesis 1, watch now. I wish I could all your faces now. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. God the Father. Then the Spirit was over the void and the darkness. Watch now. Do you realize the first three verses, the first four, is a picture of all God wants to do? It's a picture of salvation. He's created you, but you were born into sin which means you were born in a void and in darkness. But then the Spirit of God came to you, wherever you were, hovered over your life, and revealed to you that God loves you and has made you. And notice the next verse in creation, let there be light. 
I saw the light. That salvation, God turned the light on in my void and my darkness. I saw the light. If I was a better singer and my mouth wasn't so dry, I'd throw into it. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I saw the light. And now, where there was nothing, there's something. Yeah. Only with God. Only with God. Listen, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed for a moment. I didn't intend for this to be a total apologetics kind of a message, but it, 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 it kind of went there, and I'm okay with that. I don't know where some of you are and what you believe about God. Is there a God and so forth? And again, I'm not here to defend him. And here's why, because he can defend himself. <laughs> I believe what I believe, not because somebody told me to believe it. I believe it because I experienced it. I saw the light all I can pray for is to preach the word of God and that the spirit of God would reveal to you that God loves you and your life without him is a void and darkness and pointless hear the word it's nothing it's, you say well oh pastor I'm this and I'm that listen without him you're nothing but what he does when he turns on the light is so much and so incredible and you begin a new life with him that he looks at just like he did in creation and says behold it's good it's good it begins by putting faith in him that he is who he says he is and he is Jesus the name above all names at that name every knee will bow every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord you do that this side of his return it's called salvation but, but please know we're all going to do it one day everything in the earth every person, everybody under the earth the spiritual world, everything do you know Christ as your Savior in your mind in your heart, your mind's eye could you go back to that place where you received him as Savior and you'd say you may not know the day and the hour but you knew when it happened you knew that you prayed to receive him and that heaven's your home if you're that way tonight would you just slip up your hand and say Pastor I know, I know that I know that I know Christ I know that you may put your hands down thank you for being honest and raising a hand and honest and not raising a hand tonight if you couldn't raise it with certainty listen salvation again it's not an argument to win it's just if he's revealed himself to you if there's something in your spirit and heart that's saying the pastor's telling you the truth and you realize and you sense and feel that you're undone and you don't know that heaven would be your home, what a great place right now to just put faith in the Lord Jesus. Right where you're seated, if God is opening your heart, would you just begin to pray? Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Confess your love, that, you, that he loves you and you want to be loved by him and ask him to be your savior. If you need help wording a prayer like that, let me offer this to you. You can pray this prayer behind me. If you disagree with any of it, you can bail out at any time. But if you'd like to know Christ as savior and that's the desire of your heart, pray like this. Dear God, I do believe that you love me and I confess that I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. And I believe that you, Jesus, died on the cross for my sins. And you were buried. And you rose again on the third day. And the best I know how, I'm asking you to be my Savior, forgiving me of those sins and giving me a new life. Let there be light. I'm asking it in Jesus' name. 